This is presentation on seismic response and analysis of reinforced earth retaining walls. A brief overview of RERWs are typically made up of discrete wall panel facing elements. G grids and metallic straps are wire mesh or grid or mechanically attached to the wall elements and extend back into the reinforced soil mass. Straps and grids act as an internal anchor reinforcement to hold the wall facing panels in place while stabilizing any soil retained behind the reinforced soil mass. There are several types of facing elements. The most commonly used are precast concrete panels. Here are four types of applications of these types of walls just for your information. Uh, the top left one is near and dear to my heart being a transportation engineer. You can acquire a lot of roadway width without acquiring a lot of right away uh, and that's uh, uh, true for just about any type of retaining wall, but this case is, is different because these types of walls are typically are more cost-effective uh, in field type situations. The other, the top right and bottom left show bridge bridge loads being transferred to the, the seismic or the select granular backfill or to a deeper substrata capable of support uh, through substructure elements such as piles. The fourth bottom right shows an aquatic application. The reinforced soil mass is usually a cohesion's backfill, which grips the anchor reinforcement and internally supports the wall panels in a state of stack, static equilibrium. Resi resistance to pull out is a function of vertical stress or overburden pressure over each strap or grid. Sites where select or co cohesionless backfill is scarce. Uh, you can design these types of walls for those types of soils, but the length and number of layers tends to be cost prohibitive uh, and infeasible from a constructability standpoint. Loading is due to retained earth which slopes and or is broken back backfill uh, are accounted for in the earth pressure coefficient and active earth pressures. Here we show internal stability theory. Uh, you got the select backfill acting vertically or uh, no, pro providing normal stresses to the grids to hold it in place. Uh, just think if you got uh, stress reversals due to earthquake loads, what that can do it can weaken weaken that interface friction between the two. Uh, the bottom two diagrams show a, a metallic strap with uh, ripples in it to increase the frictional resistance and then bar mesh uh, which does it in two dimensions. Here we have some external stability failure modes. It's, it's easy to point out that they're both for the static and dynamic cases. Sliding and overturning, uh, bearing capacity failures need to be investigated. The fourth is a slope stability uh, type of problem better suited for a slope stability software such as X stable. Uh, one thing to point out here is the, the maximum thrust acting on a wall generally occurs when the wall is translated or rotated toward the backfill. Uh, the minimum soil thrust is the opposite case. Uh, the magnitude and distribution of dynamic wall pressures are influenced by the mode of wall movement, which is translational, rotational, uh, what have you. The next slide shows some earth pressure distributions for the static cases, uh, for the horizontal backslope case. We show tra traffic surcharge as well. Here you can see the points of application of the resultant forces, uh, as well as the reinforced soil mass acts acting downward to resist sliding or, or overturning, and then the, the base foundation dimensions. Um, here what we've got to do is incorporate the seismic forces uh, and their effect on the wall as well uh, and their points of application which will be shown here in the next few slides. The next slide shows the Coulomb theory uh, for active earth pressure coefficients. Uh, the points of application of the different forces, the active earth pressure, uh, the force against from the retained soil mass against the failure plane, uh, the weight of the, the the active or wedge failure zone, as well as the inclination of the slope backfill behind the wall. Also, function beta is the angle between a vertical and the back 
base of the concrete retaining wall uh, which is factored into the Coulomb earth pressure coefficient. This next slide shows the active earth pressure coefficient for the static case which we just discussed and the uh, parameters therein uh, which were noted on the previous slide. The dynamic case uh, shows the Mononabe Okabe version which is an extension of Coulomb theory and it factors in uh, the term theta which is a function of the uh, horizontal and vertical pseudostatic acceleration coefficients which are de defined there below. In most cases the vertical pseudostatic acceleration coefficient can be taken as zero because it has minimal effect on the, the results uh, found. The next slide shows seismic forces applied in external stability analyses. Uh, to the left you'll see that the internal inertial force uh, that's exerted on the reinforced soil mass. Its uh, point of application is, is at the center of the dynamic mass, uh, the width being 0.5 times the height of the wall. Over to the right you'll show 50% of PAE, which is defined below the equation for both PAE and PIR defined below and it's assumed at 50 percent because the PIR inertial force and reinforced soil mass and the active dynamic active earth pressure don't occur or don't peak at the same time so it's assumed at 50 percent. You also have an equation for the maximum wall acceleration there as well. Here we're showing the inertial forces due to earthquake loading for internal stability analyses. As you, as you can see, for inextensible reinforcement and extensible reinforcements, uh, the failure wedges are different, uh, the active zones are different, uh, which also leads you to the effective length of the geogrids or straps behind the active zones uh, being different as well. Uh, those uh, links, effective links, are the links used in calculating the resistance. Anything within the active zone should not be included uh, as far as resistance to pull out. The next slide, we're talking about factors of safety, external stability for sliding and overturning. You need to only achieve 75% for the static case, of the static case. Uh, and it's the same for pullout, with regard for, to pullout, 75% of the minimum allowable static safety factor. However, the frictional coefficients for pullout should be reduced to about 80% 80, 80 of the static values for seismic loading. As you recall, the theory for internal stability was shown earlier, what those stress reversals are doing to that interaction with the straps. The dynamic effects of, on types of soil reinforcement. Uh, as the stiffness of the reinforced soil mass decreases, damping and amplification may increase, resulting in little change in the inertial force between extensible and inextensible reinforcement. This leads one to to, to analyze it uh, from a, re regards to internal stability. They can be estimated to be the same for both types of reinforcements. Stiffness variances between extensible and inextensible reinforcement affect the reinforced soil mass and its reaction to the induced earthquake vibrations. The overall performance of these types of walls is good. The first bullet there indicates some failures uh, that were noted in the upper reinforcement layers, uh, but you have very little confining pressures up there. The last two bullets uh, indicate that the walls appear to function well in seismic events. My conclusion is that uh, conventional rigid non-flexible retaining walls may be a thing of the past. Since these types of walls uh, can accept tolerable differential settlements uh, as well as, as perform well during uh, seismic events leads me to that conclusion. References. The bottom reference is uh, a manual that uh, is very good for new engineers dealing with these types of walls and I highly recommend that uh, uh, this manual, the FHWA puts out a good manual which reviews the seismic and dynamic analyses of these types of walls. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much.